there's over 150 years of uh, signal integrity, power integrity, measurement experience on this panel. And if uh, what I've said, and certainly not to distract or detract from any of the uh, members of the panel, if Eric is the king of this topic, this is certainly the court, uh, his court. I mean, this is really, really something we're proud to bring to you, to you all. So without overselling it, without any further ado, let's bring in Eric Bogatin once again and his panel. Thank you so much. Well, hey, welcome everybody. This is our panel discussion on uh, 150 people years of expertise in signal and power integrity. And I'm really thrilled to have with us uh, four industry experts that I've known for many, many years. Uh, and part of the reason that we invited all of these experts is because every time I listen to them or talk to them, I always learn something new and I want to have an opportunity for all of our experts to share uh, with you folks at Altium Live, uh, some of their expertise. And by way of introduction, what I'm gonna do is ask each of our distinguished panelists to do just a one or two minute uh, little uh, a summary of uh, kind of uh, w w how they kind of got into this field and, and what they're doing now. And then we're gonna, we're gonna take over a few um, a little snapshot questions everybody's gonna uh, have a chance to answer, maybe spending one or two minutes and, and we'll kind of uh, go around the panel. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna ask Steve to do a quick intro, one or two minutes about kind of uh, what you're doing now and how'd you get into uh, this field of, uh, you're, you're one of the world's uh, experts in power integrity, how'd you get into this field, Steve? So it's been a long path, I'll tell you that. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I started back in the 1970s and I was a hobbyist, I guess, you know, like so many engineers started in audio systems. And, and I started my career building very high powered audio systems for discotheques. And, and from there, somehow I ended up working on uh, fighter planes. And in 1978, I ended up working on the space shuttle. And from the time I worked on the space shuttle, um, up until now, I've been involved primarily in, in power electronics. And I can tell you, boy, it's changed an awful lot since the 1970s. Wow. Uh, and so it's been a really interesting path. In, in uh, the late 1990s, I was called on to, to model the space station. I needed a, to make the simulation model of the space station. And I spent six years doing it, and, and it was a great six years. But by the end, I was pretty much burned out, and I realized that one of the, the biggest issues that we had was that, you know, we were trying to make these models from data that was for the most part bad. And so that's why now I'm, I'm really in more of a test and measurement uh, market space. And that's just because I got tired of working with bad data. And so we, we, we get our own data now for those models, but it's kind of zigged and zagged a little bit, but it's been a really fun path. So let me follow up one quick question. For what was it that got you into that, that initial activity uh, with electronics and discotheques? What, what was it that uh, got you into that, the, the electronics field in general? So really funny story. I was, I was dating a, a, a girl. I was a teenager in high school and her dad was a judge. Her mom was a lawyer. Both bro brothers were lawyers. And they said, what do you want to do? You know, when you finish college and I said, I want to be a guitarist. <laughs> and, uh, uh -oh. And that was great. So for my electric guitar skills, it was awesome. And I was no longer allowed to date their daughter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let's go to um, Heidi. Uh, what's, what's your origin story? How did you get oh. into this? What are you doing now? I, I think I went through a, through a few curves and circles and loops. Um, but I, I actually, it's actually inspiring. I um, have to credit it to Bill and Dave. Um, Hewlett Packard had a local internship program that I got into in high school, which got me involved with electronics. I built my first power supply. It was awesome, uh, which, you know, then led to get me that I, I was able to get into Caltech, which is an amazing university. Uh, and also at HP, I built my first little solar cells as one of my intern projects. And that led to uh, actually working for Arco Solars, which was Arco Solar it was bought by Siemens. So I have you know, a patent on solar cell design. Then uh, I kind of met my husband and off I went on another adventure. Um, Caltech gives you a great background in physics. And so I leveraged that and jumped right into uh, working for NASA on hydrogen fire and gas detection at NASA's Dennis Space Center in Mississippi, uh, working on the you know, space shuttle program. It was awesome. Uh, then I, you know, got homesick for California and I missed HP. So back to Hewlett Packard I came, uh, but now I had to jump into RF microwave uh, packaging. And so I started getting really adept at high frequency 
uh, circuit design and packaging. And then, um, you know, the industry, the, the uh, ATE industry was sort of struggling with their load boards and high-speed digital design. It was the time of Vertex, uh, Vertex 4 with Xilinx. And um, I, I actually switched over to the ATE group and started helping out with signal integrity, uh, high-frequency design on printed circuit boards. Went to my first design con in 2006 and loved it. <laughs> So I think, you know, you, you, uh, Howard Johnson was there, uh, yourself, Lee Ritchie, and it was just fun to see the, the passion of these people that really liked building things and seeing how they work and trying to explain it to people. So, um, yeah, once I got into signal integrity, I, I never left. And then uh, Steve Sandler, I have to credit for power integrity because he showed up at one of our uh, design con TPC technical program committees and he said hey you know I, I I have this square printed circuit board I got out of lab stock and I connected it up to a network analyzer and I'm it's a PDN and I, I put a load on it and none of the simulators are giving me the right answer <laughs> and I said well let me take a look and you know I I pulled that simple little square board in and and um, ran some EM simulations and we started getting the data to correlate with his measurement and it was very exciting and that was my my introduction to really start uh, understanding the important importance of impedance in the delivery of power to a load so um, I guess yeah that's how I finally got to power integrity and where I'm uh, today working and and now you're at Keysight uh, oh. in power integrity and uh, and you're one of the ADS experts what's your role with um, ADS at Keysight so I, I do have to mention that I, when I was working with ATE, I was building hardware and I was actually doing lots of measurements and building. Um, but I got a little frustrated because I really wanted to spend some time understanding the, the simulators and how to get the simulators to match and predict what I was building. And so um, I did have an opportunity uh, about 10 years ago to uh, join the uh, Keysight Pathways ADS uh, simulation EDA tool group. And that now I'm actually getting to do a lot um, more with simulation and really understand how those tools work. And so I, again, you're, you're hitting on one of my passions. I like to build things. Um, and so I still do a lot of simulation and measurement correlation uh, to, to get those two uh, 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 fields uh, to actually agree with each other. Yeah, both of you guys have mentioned the importance of that measurement, simulation, correlation. We're going to return to that a, a little bit later. Uh, hey, Rula, let's go to you. So I've known you for, I don't know, a dozen years or so uh, from DesignCon. I, I've seen you uh, grow through the industry. How did you get started in this field? And what are you doing now? Um, well, I've been, uh, I work for a company now uh, that's based out of the United Kingdom, and uh, they do AIs artificial intelligence, and uh, it, it's a startup company, and it's a great opportunity. Um, they have their very interesting and challenging things that I have to work on, which is kind of exciting. Uh, I like working on challenging uh, problems. Um, I started off my career as actually, um, when I first graduated from college, I worked for Raytheon worked in the missile group <laughs> for a few years oh. and worked on uh, the second Patriot missile. And it was kind of an interesting uh, project. Um, and uh, then transitioned to the satellite uh, group and uh, was doing some uh, RF design. And that's when I realized my passion for RF and microwave. So I went ahead and pursued a master's degree in microwave engineering. Um, and I realized how much I loved it. So I continued doing RF design until I switched my, uh, um, my, my job. And uh, they had limited projects that were microwave design aspects. So I was asked if I could help out with some signal integrity problems. And it was from there, <laughs> it's been an interesting path and very challenging path. And uh, Later on, uh, obviously, as I continued to grow, I started facing PI issues, and they have their own challenging aspects as well. But since then, I've switched multiple careers and continue to deal with different aspects of problems. And now I work for a company. I'm designing their package designs <laughs> uh, so, for very so high you, speed. High, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, when you um, left high school, 
um, or, or college and you went into Raytheon, did you go specifically into um, electronics or was there another aspect of uh, satellite design that you got involved in it at Raytheon? No, actually it was uh, at, when I first started, I started off in the electronics missiles group, looking at radomes and missile comp uh, radon compensations and it was, uh, let's not talk too much about it. <laughs> it was an interesting project. <laughs> uh, you're training in electronics and you were able to continue that with uh, yes. your, your first yeah. job and, and follow that yeah. in your career. Yeah, my second job was really where I've really found my passion is designing microwave uh, systems, uh, transceivers, um, you know, all aspects of it, high frequency. It, it was really fascinating. And I realized that's the path I want to continue pursuing. Wow. And it's fun. So um, I've known you for, for many, many years um, from our early days when we were in, in Sun together. Uh, how, how did you get into this field and, and uh, what are you doing now? Um, actually, even though we didn't meet in person, but we did correspond uh, years before we were at Sun. You were at a, at a company doing consulting work for packages. And I had a question about package inductance, and you answered it. I hope I got it right. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I have to uh, go back to the 60s when, as, as a little kid, uh, we were tinkering with my brother with little electronics. We built uh, packet radios and so on. And then uh, in 1970, I joined the Technical University of Budapest. And uh, there was and still is a team designing scientific satellite equipment there. So that was a very good learning experience. We, we did everything. Uh, the, the team had to design the onboard transceivers, the antenna circuits, the receivers, the power supplies, the onboard computer, also the ground control station, everything, which means EMC, SIPI, was already there, even though it was not coined as, uh, you know, disciplines. And the most amazing thing is that um, the team is still making satellites uh, as of today. So last December, they uh, uh, launched successfully the world's smallest uh, uh, so-called pocket cube satellite two inches by two inches by two inches inside, 183 grams total mass. And it is the uh, uh, first piece which creates a 3D mapping of the electrosmog, which is up there at 250 kilometers above the Earth. And you can go to the website <clears throat> and uh, you can see all of the 3D uh, rendering of the noise above the surface of the globe. It was fascinating. Wow. And, and where are you now? Um, so it, it was a long uh, road from the Technical University to Semtec where I am now. Um, at the university we also had projects for CERN on the Large Hadron Collider. Then I joined some microsystem. That's where we both used to work. Uh, I was there for 21 years, and then two years ago, I joined Semtech. I'm in the Boston Design Center now. And what do you do for Semtech? Well, signal and power integrity, you can guess. <laughs> so one of the themes that I hear from all of you is you, you kind of got into the electronics field uh, uh, kind of random walked into it almost, but once you got in, you found a passion for uh, some aspect of it. And that's kept you in this field and, and kind of kept you growing in this field. And it is remarkable that after, you know, some of us, uh, you know, I've, I've been doing this for 40 years almost. Uh, some of us, once you find that passion, that hook, it just keeps you in there. And you have, we've all just kind of grown uh, in the industry, um, uh, driven by that passion. That seems to be one of the, the key ingredients to uh, kind of uh, keep, us, keep us on a particular path. Um, so, you know, along the way, you know, we've all been this for, for many years, along the way, um, can you think of 
of you know kind of an incident or something that happened to you where you walked away having learned an important lesson something that you gained uh, from that experience that has you've that, is, that you've carried with you uh, throughout the rest of your career so one incident that you can think of that um, wow I that was a really valuable lesson and and I use that to this day so let's yeah Steve you want to go I'm doing this 40 years <laughs> <laughs> so it's probably been more than one of those moments uh, that yeah, was kind of but just kind of one, pivotal. just one. One of them, uh, for sure. You know, I was working on radar jammers back in the in the 1980s, and and we had real problems trying to do radiation hardened power supplies back in that day. We didn't even have pulse width modulators yet, and there was just one night I was, I was sleeping actually. And, and I woke up in the middle of the night and I scribbled some stuff on a, on a pad. And when I woke up, I had the answer and I knew how to do it. And I, and I got a patent for that in 1985 uh, for magnetic modulation of rad hard uh, power supplies. And I think the, the lesson was that, you know, we're so fixated on the things that we've been taught and we follow these, these guides and the rules and we do what we're supposed to do. And I think the lesson for me was we don't always have to do what it is we think we're supposed to do. We really need to, to think outside the box sometimes. And we really need to see what's in our way. And if you can just move what's in the way, out of the way, then, then you might have your answer. And that stuck with me forever. And I can tell you that there's probably been a dozen different times that that one lesson has really helped me. Oh, very good. Um, let's see, Heidi. So <clears throat> again, it's it's hard to pick one, uh, but you know, the, I think something that comes to mind as as I, I look back, I, I actually I don't know if, if anybody else does it, but I I find that to to really do well in a field or or to do well um, uh, in in the work that you do it really takes a lot of hard work. And what's interesting to me, if you're passionate about it, that time just goes by fast. And I go back and I look at, you know, some of the reports I did or some of the projects, and I realize the hours of, um, that it actually did take. And like Steve was saying, you know, even when I'm sleeping, I'm thinking about it. And mm -hmm. I, I, I often call it loading the memory banks. Um, but, you know, you're reading books, you're talking to people, you're, you know, doing simulations, you're doing measurements. And um, it's, it's that repetition of really investing, you know, just like learning a language. It's the repetition of, of really, um, you know, gathering information and using it and using it as much as you can that really leads to some amazing breakthroughs. And as, as Steve just oh. mentioned, you know, looking at problems from different directions and not always doing it the way the, the last person did. So oh. that's, that's my. Mm -hmm. Hey, Rula, what about you? Um, actually, uh, integrating early is the real thing that I learned that I use to this day. Um, it, it was a hard lesson. Uh, we had some boards or designs that I had some complications due to not knowing all the issues up front with a par or of stuff, you know, related to not having all the documentation. My, my biggest thing that I found that really helped me is obtain an eval board as early as possible. Look at the eval board, test it. Um, there has been, I've seen documentation where they tell you to do something and the eval board has something different in it. And there's a reason for that. <laughs> uh, so integrate early is the key thing to my success. Hmm. And find, identify the problems up front and design them as you go along. And I really had a successful career doing that. I had a lot of first pass successes as a result. Wow, very good. And it's fun. Yeah, so uh, there is a saying that uh, the stupid learns from his or her lessons or mistakes, and the clever people learn from other people's mistakes or just simply learn from other people. And um, it, it just reminds me that in early 2018, um, I posted a little article on, on my website uh, when I asked around a lot of the notable industry experts, what was the single most important takeaway from the over 20 years of design con earlier? And for me, it was the, um, 
the uh, VIA model, which uh, IBM came up with uh, many years ago. Uh, I do remember very vividly that in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, we tried very hard to come up with an understanding how the PC board structure uh, interferes with the high-speed signaling. And then suddenly at one of the design con conferences, IBM presented a paper which was a very simple, very elegant, very good solution. So that was probably the biggest uh, single lesson for myself in signal integrity. And what, what was that VIA model that was so simple and elegant that IBM introduced? Well, so it follows the path that we usually do when we consider, for instance, the losses in the transmission line. We fold the um, losses of the return path into the signal path and just make it a one-sided single-ended model. And the same thing can happen with the return pass when it involves a plane structure. Basically, the solution was to identify what is the impedance at the point where the VR return current has to go through the plane structure and just stick it in series to the VR model in the signal pass. And it works very well, it is very elegant. And back then, obviously today, we can do way more sophisticated solutions, but back then it was the real eye-opener just to find a good working model in such a simple way. So, you know, one of the themes that I hear through everybody's career path is, has been the role of simulation, and a number of you guys are involved in that in that right now. You know, I, I've often heard that the that phrase uh, garbage in, garbage out was created specifically for simulation. And, yes. and I'd like and, I, and I'd like to hear your opinions on how do you get around that? You know, we there's so much talk about simulation and, and, and uh, you know, I'm guilty of, of the, as much as others of, of promoting the value of simulation, but how do you, how do you help to um, kind of guarantee or at least build confidence in the simulation that it's not, not just garbage in, garbage out? Um, so, Steve, you're one of the world experts on simulations. I've read a couple of your books that that detail simulation activities. How do you, how do you help to uh, well, I mean, guarantee you're that right. you don't I mean, I, have I that started problem. simulating in the 1980s, and very quickly that garbage in, garbage out became a pervasive theme. When I started uh, my company, AEI Systems, back in 1995, I started it for the purposes of modeling the space station. And there I was working out of my living room in Chandler, Arizona. And I'm on one side of the table. And on the other side, we got NASA, Rocketdyne, and Space Systems Laurel. And I started the company with one rule, be right. Whatever it is, be right. And I learned a lot along the way, but, but um, I'll tell you that almost every model that, that runs across my desk is wrong in some way, some much more wrong than others. And I spend the majority of my customers' dollars on creating a model and validating it through tremendous numbers of, of measurements. And I agree with what Ruler said. I often say the key to fewer board spins is make more boards. And I say you design the characterization boards really early and I don't believe in eval boards. I make my own so that I have the board files and everything. Uh, and then you'll save the 18 layer board spins. And modeling is the same way. You have to model every piece before it goes onto the board and you need to know what's good and what's bad about that model so that it's all validated. And I tell my customers that's because there's gonna come a day, and I don't know exactly what day it's gonna be for you, but there's gonna be a day, you're gonna jump and you're gonna trust your simulator to catch you. And if your model isn't good enough to do that, you're gonna die. That's it, clear and simple. In my um, session here at Altium, I'm gonna talk about that in the most uh, difficult simulation in, in my entire career. And um, and I leaned on on that model and I won. So, how do you how do you look at a model and evaluate? Is it good or bad? How do you how do you do that evaluation of the quality of a model? There's some telltale signs. So first, let me not blame the the manufacturer on all of the the model woes. A lot of it 
is, is due to the manufacturer, but not all of it. They deliver a model and very often it is a very detailed report and the report says, you know, we modeled it to include these features and these features are not included and so on and so forth. The simulator companies grab that model, they strip out all the report stuff, they put the net list into a database and you, the, the user, you pull it out of a database and you don't get any of those notes that say what it does and what it doesn't do. There are some telltale signs when you look at a, a a semiconductor model, it says automatically generated by mod packs. That's a really telltale sign that it's gonna be wrong. Um, I love Worth to death. I never say bad things about him, but I got lots of models from Worth where Worth is spelled wrong. And I said, you know, if they spell their name wrong in their model, there's a high probability the model's not gonna be great. Uh, the other thing that I'm looking for is when I look for validation data, and I learned this in Space Station, always look for what's not there. Um, and I'll give you an example. There was one uh, report that I saw from NASA and they had data in one amp increments in their powertrain all the way up one amp, except they were missing like five of them. It went one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine. And I said, what happened to all those missing ones? And they said, oh, that was bad data. Mm. And I said, okay, I want to see those. Those are the ones I want to see. The rest you can throw away. Uh, you need to focus on what's not there, not, not what is. And that's where most of the models run into trouble. There's also another piece of that. And I would say, what's the criticality of the model? There's some stuff, it just really doesn't matter whether it's perfect or not. There's other stuff that it really does. And so you need to understand what parts of this model really need to, to work well and which parts don't really matter because models are really expensive. Mm -hmm. And if you're gonna build a, a good model, it's gonna take time and effort Focus on the things that matter. Okay, and Heidi, you you work for a uh, simulation, uh, or your products are simulation tools right now. How do you tell your customers how how do they what advice do you give them about how to avoid garbage in, garbage out? <laughs> well, I, I I actually need to start off with a, a fun quote from DesignCon that I just love, and it's it's based on an old uh, quote from Einstein, but they gave it a new twist for signal integrity and power integrity. And, and this, this application here. But basically, nobody believes a simulation except for the person that did the simulation. And everybody believes the measurement except for the person that did the measurement. And I must say I agree because it, it is true. When I sit there and do a simulation, I know all of the assumptions I made. Um, if I create the models, I know all of my assumptions. I, I know where the, the, the you know, it, where the model doesn't work and where it does work. And so I'm really excited about my, my simulation. But when I do a measurement, um, the measurement actually includes everything, whether I want it or not. <laughs> and a lot of times when you do a measurement, you, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, you, you're always sometimes wanting to go back and try again because it, you, you, you maybe forgot to uh, do the calibration as precisely as you wanted to, um, or you learned something, um, uh, you know, we weren't too sure about how the fixturing was done or something. But um, back to that, when, when, you know, helping customers understand simulation and measurement, and I've been doing a lot of papers and working with IEEE, IEEE P370 on uh, fixture removal for, for uh, measurements at high frequency, but one of the things um, that is, I guess, my pet peeve a little bit, and I think it's really good engineering practice, uh, is you should always simulate something that you know and simulate something or, or measure something that you know. And so on the simulation side at high frequency, um, I really like the, the little simple uh, series resonant uh, baby, I call it a baby structure, but it's just a series stepped impedance uh, resonator. And it's a very simple structure to fabricate, very simple structure to put into an EM simulator. And if you can't get the two to correlate or in the process of getting them to correlate, you learn a lot more about the accuracy of your uh, port setups and simulation, your mesh densities. You also learn a lot about fabrication tolerances. Um, on the power integrity side, I think I mentioned the square board before um, with, with Steve Sandler. That was uh, uh, always a good one. Um, but again, uh, Steve has always drilled that into me when I first started doing some of the real low impedance micro ohm uh, impedance measurements with the two port shunt, uh, something that ISFAN's uh, well known for at DesignCon. But, you know, the first thing he said, well, after your calibration, measure something you know. You got to measure something you know. And it's true. Um, you can't just think the calibration worked and jump right into measurement. Then you have to constantly keep checking that your calibration is still valid. So 
that, that would be my lesson learned for high frequency SI and PI type application. Very good. So you're, it's one of the most important consistency tests to uh, do something where you know the answer to either measurement or, or simulation. Mm -hmm. Very good. Hey, Rula, do you have any uh, uh, words of advice about how to uh, gain a little more confidence in your simulation results so it's not just a case of garbage in, garbage out? Yes, actually. <laughs> um, see if the vendor is willing to give you measurement versus correlation uh, simulation. And, and I've seen it where most vendors refuse to give you that data. I worked with a specific, I won't mention names, I worked with a specific customer and we were doing a, IBIS AMI um, validation of their models. And every time I asked for a measurement, so I could have, because obviously with IBIS AMI, you, every tool you use, you get different results. That's a known problem with IBIS AMI. Um, and they refused to give me, like they kept coming up with different excuses not to give me the measurements. So I had no idea that, you know, the models that we're being given is actually matches what I would expect. Um, a validation report is very helpful. I'll get you, at least start you in the right path. Do you, do you um, find that, um, uh, that companies that provide that measurement simulation correlation or that validation, do you find that um, they, uh, they tend to be um, larger companies, more advanced companies? Uh, is there a correlation to the size of the company and their expertise? It does, and actually. Yeah, it, it really does. I, it depends. I mean, I don't want to mention names, but I have had some, a lot of success with certain companies that, um, that they're willing, the bigger the company, they're more willing or willing to work with you and give you the information mm -hmm. that you're you're, so, you know, so you're saying that's an important value add for you as a customer or con consumer that having that kind of data from a vendor um, helps influence your decision about using that vendor. Correct. Correct. Okay. We're, yeah. That's really important input to a lot of the companies out there that are producing either the products or the, or the models. Yeah. Good. And Isfan, what about you? How do you avoid the, the garbage in garbage out syndrome? Well, so I think the responsibility eventually also goes back to the user. It is very important <laughs> that we, simulation users, we understand how the tool works and it takes time. Some tools have a very long uh, learning curve and we have to go through it. And eventually the key is that we uh, bring the three things together that also was mentioned earlier, that um, we do simulations, of course. We do our measurements, but then we have to have some kind of understanding. And I know that, uh, Eric, one of your rules is that we always have to expect something before we start a measurement or simulation. What do we expect to see? And if you don't see that, we should be able to explain why. Either our measurements was not correct or the simulation was not correct or our understanding was incorrect. And we have to work until those three, the measurement simulations and our understanding all agree to a reasonable degree of difference because they will never agree perfectly. But, uh, you know, whatever we can afford as kind of tolerance in engineering, we have to get an agreement within those bounds. And that's probably the most important thing that users, we, we have to do whether we do measurements or simulations, and sometimes we don't have to, uh, or don't have time to do all of that, which is okay, but our goal always should be to have all those three lining up. You know, one of the common things that, themes that I'm hearing from all of you is that there, there are two important takeaways, it sounds like. One is never use a simulation tool blindly. Never assume that you, it's easy to get a result. You push the button, you get a result, but you have to understand what it's really doing and what some of the assumptions are. And the other is that it sounds like the return on investment that you make in trying to do uh, measurement system or measurement simulation correlation, if, if nothing else in a simple system, but that return on investment you make is really valuable, that it's worth the extra effort to do that measurement simulation correlation at, at some point. 
Um, so very, very important advice. And Steve, I want you to unmute yourself, Steve, so that we can catch all of your little comments because those are usually the best ones. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Sorry, so, I, got, I got dogs here, so I'm trying to make sure they don't make too much that's noise. That's okay. That's okay. I got a cat here <laughs> that's going to probably meow in a, in a little bit here. Uh, so, so I also, um, you know, all of us have been involved in the industry for a long time. We um, have given back a lot to the industry, and we're all actively involved in, in not only um, uh, learning more, listening to uh, webinars and, and reading articles and books, but also presenting them. And I wanted to give you each a chance to say a little bit about some of those activities, either are, what are you presenting or what have you presented in the, in the recent time? What, what kind of uh, topics have you talked about and, and where can others um, hear, hear about them? And also, um, or, or what have you been listening to? What have you been reading? What, what uh, sort of uh, places do you go to, to learn more about uh, a move up the learning curve in signal integrity, power integrity? So Steve? So all right, the first part's really easy. Where do I go to learn um, to the stuff you guys produce? Uh, so <laughs> I read everything you guys write. Uh, I do try to watch you know, a lot of the webinars and I'm guilty of the same things as everybody else. A lot of it's on in the background and I wait until something really catches my attention. I do read all of the trade journals religiously, um, but also I, I learn a lot from my customers that I teach. And it's one of the reasons I love to teach is that I learn so much from my customers. Uh, you know, I've been teaching a really long time. In the 1990s, I wrote the uh, worst case analysis class for NASA. And I taught that at Motorola University until they closed. And now I still teach that privately. So teaching worst case analysis is something I've always done. When I wrote my, my uh, Power Integrity book in 2014, I had promised I was never going to write another book. And, and, and people asked me why I did, you know, when I, I was so clear that I wouldn't. It's a very different power integrity book. It was really about measurements and I didn't write it because I wanted to write it. I wrote it because I was really pissed off. It's like, how, how come nobody's learning to make measurements? You know, um, the, the models come from measurements and if the measurements are bad, so is the model. Every, everything relies on this data and nobody knows how to make decent measurements. And so that's why I wrote that book. And maybe you saw it on LinkedIn this week or maybe not, but I just opened an online measurements class. I taught it every year about eight times a year as an in-person hands-on mm -hmm. class. And because of COVID, I can't do that. But we had about 500 people that were wanting to, to take the class. And so we just made it online. And it's, uh, it just opened actually yesterday. And okay. it's, it's all the way from the basics of how you measure noise, all the way up to how you measure something like, uh, you know, the Hadron Collider. <clears throat> and, and just an opportunity for a blatant plug, where, where exactly do you go to find more information about your online class? PicoTestOnline.com. PicoTestOnline.com. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Heidi, what have you been uh, doing in, in, in spreading the, the gospel out there? Um, so, of course, I'm, you know, with Keysight's uh, Pathways ADS, the EDA tools, and I'm actually hired on in the marketing department. Uh, I like to advertise that I'm, you know, an applications engineer, but truly I am in the marketing department. So they're, they keep me busy. Um, they keep me signed up for uh, Keysight educational, engineering educational webinars. There's a lot of those. Uh, Keysight has a great website of all the different content that we're, we're putting out there every week. Um, but I guess I should also plug uh, one of the ways I stay current, stay on top of things is uh, <laughs> signing myself up for papers and articles and, and conferences. So, you know, it, it always sounds like a great idea um, and it is but it does take some work to, to write papers. And, you know, DesignCon is, is my favorite, um, like Steve was mentioning. Uh, I love reading all the articles from, from yourself and from Isfan and Rula and, um, and catching up with everything. But I do have to say, I, I do like that one-on-one -on -one contact. I like the face-to-face -face interactions. And so I have also been involved with um, the technical program committee at DesignCon. And that actually, um, we get together once a year as a small group. And it's really fun because you are with the experts and it's a smaller group and you get a chance to catch up on uh, what everybody's working on and what the, the next uh, topics or hottest things are gonna be for the coming, coming year. Um, so that's been good. And then I also am involved with the EPEPS uh, 
uh, Packaging Society, uh, the EPEPS conference, uh, which is coming up actually in two weeks here, <laughs> uh, right yeah. at the same time as Altium Live, uh, we're kind of overlapping a little bit. So uh, EPEPS is starting at the beginning of the week, and, and I'll be involved there and doing some power integrity uh, tutorials and a paper with Steve Sandler. So I, wow. I try to, to share my knowledge with everybody by writing papers. I think that's the best way because it does get you know, uh, much easier for people to look up those papers uh, in, uh, for a long time to come. Uh, and then I wanted to add one little minor detail. You know, it is a nice, uh, it, you know, you, you want to tell everybody, yes, I want to educate people. I want to share my knowledge. Um, Steve mentioned that he wanted to, you know, he got frustrated that people weren't doing measurements correctly, so he wrote a book to show them how. I have to admit that sometimes it's more of a personal reason. I actually do papers and I do tutorials and presentations because I really want to try to figure out the elegant way to solve something or to explain something. And it's what Isfan was remembering that paper at DesignCon about vias that was just fantastic to him. And it takes a lot of, you know, presentations and papers and really looking at the problem and trying to describe it to anybody you can find who will listen to you uh, to start to come up with that elegant solution. And so uh, that's one of the reasons I also like to do teaching or present to other people because it forces me to really learn the topic uh, in depth. I get a lot of emails that mention the webinars that you're doing, but if someone wanted to find some of the webinars that you've presented, uh, where's a good place to, to go? I think you can just Google Keysight webinars, uh, K-E-E -E webinars, and you'll, it'll pop up. Okay, great. And, and Rula, uh, what about you? Where do you go for keeping abreast and, and helping you uh, uh, kind of accelerate up the learning curve? Um, I actually, uh, I'm involved with the Signal Integrity Journal, and there's amazing papers that are being posted on that single integrity journal and I'm constantly being asked to review papers which kind of forces me if I didn't have time to review something <laughs> and look at something um, but uh, also uh, design con uh, I'm, I'm involved with multiple tracks on design con and um, as a result of that I end up reviewing a lot of papers and reading about new techniques, new methods of doing things, which is kind of really neat. And one of my favorites now, actually, I've been enjoying a great deal. Actually, Samtech has launched, uh, it's kind of an advertising for Samtech, but no, um, launched their uh, Geek Can Speak uh, seminars that have been very, very interesting talks, and they're really educational. Um, I, I really do enjoy them. And you have been doing a lot of... Um, um, talks and papers and seminars that I've been just going through a lot of that and as I, as Steve said I put it in the background and, and sometimes some something picks up my attention and you know you pick up something new you always pick up something new when you read a yeah. paper or or listen to somebody else yeah. so it's kind of been keeping me on my toes <laughs> okay good and and it's fun yeah, I think I can just second what all of my esteemed colleagues mentioned, and with, with one caveat, probably. So, um, it is true that uh, making papers is, is very useful. It is also true that teaching is, is useful for us, not necessarily as a self-expression only, but also for learning. But on that, that regard, let, let me mention that... Um, you know what, the, the, the basic reason why I still do teaching in, in the past uh, 23 years I've been in the industry, and I never wanted to give up teaching because that forces me to understand things better, clearer to be able to explain. Because multiple times it happened when I thought I understood something, and then I tried to explain it to someone, and suddenly it dawned on me, no, maybe I don't really understand it yet. So I had to go back to the drawing board, start from the beginning, and find the correct answer. So in that regard, for me, teaching is part of the self-education. That forces me to go through the problems in a more systematic way, just as I mentioned. So 
in that, that regard, uh, I've been enjoying this. Back, back in my home country, as used to be a professor at the university. Uh, but ever since then, back then, I was doing purposely industry work because I found that a lot of the professors were speaking about things that they had no clue how was implemented. So the two sides is very important, I think, for the complete understanding. Yeah. And um, uh, you, you are too modest to mention it, but I wanted to second what, what Rula had said about the wonderful uh, webinar series that you guys at Samtech have, have put on. The, what is it called? Geeks Who Speak or Geek, Geek uh, Speak? Geek Speak. Uh, Geek every, speak. Uh, it's basically right now in, in the fall, it's every two weeks on Thursdays. And uh, Semtech has a wonderful array of experts on signal integrity, power integrity. So you can go to the uh, Semtech website, you can sign it up. And um, it is really fascinating, yes. So on, on that note, so, so that is really a wonderful service that um, Samtech is is providing for the rest of the industry. We we have a chance to learn from the expertise that you guys have collected in that in your wonderful full team there. Um, and and Heidi spends a lot of her time, you know, telling the world what she knows, as well as Steve and 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 Rula as well. Why do you guys do that? What is the 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 motivation to want to share? what what you know you know you could just stay in your little area and and apply what you've learned and take advantage of it to add value in your companies but why do you take the time oh i wish i could learn how to just stay in my area <laughs> <laughs> you know i keep being tempted i wish i could learn to do that why do i you know i, I get this question a lot why do i do it yeah. and and often i answer because i don't know how not to uh, but I'm sure that there's more to it than that. You know, th there were things that were important to me. It was important to me that engineering has been so good to me. I wanted to make sure that I gave back more than I took, right? And so that was something that was important to me. Uh, when I was young, I, you know, I was cocky, like, like most young engineers, and now I'm old. And I think most young engineers are cocky, and they don't agree with most of what they want to do. But still, I say, you know what? Um, they're going to carry the torch, and what I want them to do is I want them to start where I ended. I don't want them to start where I started, right? This is supposed to be a relay. And so if they can take everything I learned, they can kick it up 10 notches. And if they got to start where I started, they're going to end up right where I did. And so, so I'm hoping that I'm helping to move the, the ball forward and to make sure that they gave more than I took. Very good. And Heidi, what is it that drives you to share your wisdom with the rest of us? Um, well, you know, I did kind of mention I'm guilty of, of wanting to actually learn more on a topic. And so doing, you know, education and presenting and training people really forces you to understand the topic. But, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I think the other one is, as Steve was mentioning, as you get older, you know, you get kind of tired of repeating things. <laughs> so you kind of want to move on. And so from that angle, I find that um, I really in, want to invest the time in the educational content and the videos are wonderful, or even papers, like I said, they last forever. And that makes it a lot easier when someone, you know, when a, cu a customer or somebody asks you a question or SRIPI and you say, hey, read this paper um, or watch this video, it's much easier than spending an hour on the phone or hour in a WebEx uh, repeating something that you've you've done a million times and so uh, you know it's an efficiency type thing I think it just makes sense it's a uh, learning how to make your career more efficient um, and sharing it with others and, and, and like Steve was saying everybody advancing and and really you have been a active participant on you mentioned in the signal integrity journal editorial advisory board and and I've had many discussions with you over over the years what is it that drives you to share what you know in, in to the rest of the industry why do you why do you do that self gratification i mean it, it, helping somebody else and um positive feedback um it just this the self fulfillment almost in, in in the whole aspect of it um you know as steve said you kind of want to give back you know not just keep taking essentially um, there's the, the, the something says about that that you know you want to see others grow too and 
there's part of it as a, there's a selfish side to it. I hate to say it. Yeah, <laughs> um, there is, there is um, you know, when you're overloaded and you're helping a colleague or somebody, if you teach them um, that then you could be left to do all the, you know, the things that you're more interested in doing um, and having them, you know, learn on their own or, or pick up the, the rest of the, st the load as well. So there is to that part of it, like when you're working for a company and there's, you know, this limited amount of resources and you're overloaded, having somebody that doesn't have as much experience teaching them how to do something, you're now offloaded to do the more complicated, more interesting stuff that you enjoy more. Mm -hmm. and, and That's a selfish fun. reason. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. No, very good. And, and it's fun from your perspective, what, what drives you in? And I'm also curious, you know, this, program that Samtech has put off put put forward the the uh, geek speak has been such a wonderful feature for the industry um, what what is it that that drives you to want to share your wisdom with the rest of us and what is it that drives Samtech to want to volunteer this uh, wonderful resource for the for the rest of the industry well um, I think for Samtech the driving uh, motivation is to make sure that people understand the value of the company the knowledge that the company has. Um, most of the time when you ask about Semtech, people think about simple connectors, but there is so much more at Semtech. The uh, uh, sophisticated uh, products and, and also the knowledge and just making sure that people are aware of it. That's, uh, you know, uh, the, the placement of the company uh, among the top key players in signal integrity, power integrity. That's mm. one, one motivation. And personally for myself, as, as it was mentioned by others, basically just giving back. Uh, I think we can all say that we are fortunate that we had good mentors, we had good colleagues, we have had a lot of help from them. So this is time for us to give back. And in that sense, this is uh, a good fulfillment. But personally for me, I, I mentioned earlier that for me, uh, learning, that's part of the learning process. If I am able to explain something, uh, then it is probably something that I understand sufficiently. If I can't explain it, no, then I don't understand it yet. Very good. Well, we only have a couple minutes left. And in the last few minutes, I wanted to give each of you a chance to offer one or two pieces of advice to other maybe junior engineers out there that are getting started in their career. What, what would you advise them to do to help them uh, in, in, in their career path? So, Steve? For me, this is an easy one because I give this advice constantly. <laughs> Every young person, go meet an old person. <laughs> um, these gray hairs that we have, they were earned the hard way, and you may be full of piss and vinegar, we're full of wisdom. So we'll take your energy and we'll give you the wisdom. Very Make good. friends with an so, old guy. Go find a gray beard. That's it. <laughs> or old person. Okay. Heidi, what's your word of, words of wisdom for advice for, to the young engineers? For, for the young engineers? Uh, I'd probably say read the manual. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. They don't do that. <laughs> um, but y you know, and and I, I, you know, we have YouTube and videos and and all this stuff now to learn things. Um, but I, I, I guess I, you know, coming from the simulation world, the simulation tools are so powerful nowadays uh, in terms of SI and PI you know, get a hold of a simulator and, and start just running some simulations and, and get, get proficient at it. It's, um, if you, you know, it's, and, and, you know, measurements, if you have access to measurement equipment, uh, you know, get out there and, and use it, um, use these tools and, and don't be shy about reading the manual. <laughs> um, but I guess that, that would be my big thing. And, you know, I think one of my strengths, and I don't know whether you kind of have to balance it, but, I also found that I, I really enjoyed talking to people, telling people what I'm working on. Mm. So I encourage young engineers, 
be excited, be passionate about what you're working on. And don't be shy to walk up to somebody and say, hey, I'm working on this. And, and I ran into this problem. Or have you seen this before? So, you know, and, and it doesn't have to just be uh, one mentor in, in your network. Um, you, can, you can use a bunch of different people and just, you know, tell them what you're working on and, and share. And, and you'll be surprised at um, what you can run into in terms of advice and, and um, different perspectives on what you're working on. So I, I highly recommend, you know, don't be shy. Pick up the phone in these days and, and call, call a, a colleague and tell them what you're working on. Okay. And, and Rula, what's your piece of advice to young engineers out there getting started? Highly recommend take a, a class. <laughs> Hi, I mean, learn it the right way the first time so you're not doing it a hundred times <laughs> over. Um, it, it, it's, it's the best advice. Uh, I've, as you know, Eric, I've taken a class with you and I've taken a class with Isfahan many years ago and it really helped. It really helped understanding things the right way knowing what to do the first time and why things work the way they do. Um, not just how, why is a key thing so you can apply it again and again. Um, ho hopefully as engineers, we learn just to take something and know how it works and reapply it. So it's not just for a specific thing. So. Very good. And Isfan, your words of advice to the young engineers out there. Yeah, very briefly, uh, stay curious and never give up. If you don't find the answer the first time, then keep going until you find it. Because that's the way to do good engineering products. Just back for one sentence what I mentioned, read the manual. It is a good idea if we have the manual. <laughs> At one point, we had um, a, a broken Hewlett Packard, so that, that tells the age of the equipment, a banged up S parameter test kit. And we didn't have the manual for it. And it was so marvelously engineered that it was possible to take it apart. I took it apart in one hour, repaired it, put it back without a manual within half an hour, and it was working. So. Uh, don't give up and stay curious. That's a great ending line to stay curious. And one of the themes that I've been hearing here is follow your passion uh, and, uh, and, and stay curious with it. Well, we've run out of time. This all time we have. I really appreciate all the time you guys have spent with us sharing your wisdom and your experiences. Um, I, I want you all to stick around. We're going to have a, open the floor up to Q&A uh, and uh, we'll, we'll turn the uh, the presentation back to um, our moderators and uh, stick around. Uh, we'll open the floor for Q&A and uh, we'll keep you guys around. So with that, thank you all very much for joining us today and thank you at Altium Live for uh, participating uh, uh, for our uh, panel of uh, 150 person years of uh, expertise in signal integrity and power integrity. Thanks everybody and stick around and uh, uh, submit your questions to us. Okay, thank you uh, for chairing this session, Eric. Okay. Always a pleasure to chat with you guys. And hey, I got a four for one deal here. I get to talk, chat with all four of you at, at one time. Nice, That's been nice wonderful. To see you yeah. got to say that. Definitely. It really is nice to see you really all. Good. It is. Definitely. Okay. Thanks, everybody. And uh, we'll, we'll stick Thank around you. and come back and answer questions. Thanks. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric, and everybody. Um, you know, Eric, I was able to hang with you, I thought, pretty well on the RLC discussion, but uh, I must say uh, the brain trust that you've assembled here is uh, it's quite intimidating. Fortunately, uh, fortunately, the questions seem to be much more around the day in a life uh, versus uh, really kind of deep technical issues, so I think I'll be able to keep up with you guys. Uh, also, Heidi, um, to hear you say read the manual, I, I had flashbacks to my youth. My father uh, is an electrical engineer. My mother is a mathematician. And uh, as a young kid, always getting into stuff, taking things apart, I always would ask questions and they would, that was always there. Well, did you read the instructions? <laughs> read the instructions. And now as a proud father of three 13 year olds, um, they come to me with, with seemingly absurd questions. And that's always my response. Did you read the instructions? Did you read the instructions? <laughs> So that I think is just good life advice, whether you're, you're a passionate and curious engineer or not. Um, and with that, we did get some questions. We are gonna kind of press for time, unfortunately, um, but I suspect 
you're going to have answers to these. And this first question, I think we kind of addressed in the last session, Eric. Uh, but I wanted to bring it up anyway, because I can hear Rick Hartley's voice talking about current and where current actually flows. Does it flow through the copper or does it flow through the space between the copper and the boards? I think we all know the answer to that. But um, I'm going to ask this question. I have always designed multi-layer boards and never routinely used ground fills on the top or the bottom. However, after listening to a presentation from Rick Hartley, it seems like with a two-layer board, the ground layer is so far away that you need returns next to the signals to avoid crosstalk. It seems that a ground fill with adequate ground vias to the bottom layer is a good solution. Oh, I see Heidi shaking your head no. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. I'll let Eric take it. <laughs> well, that's no, Eric's actually, response, I, hey, Heidi. It depends. Hey. That's his famous response. <laughs> um, hey, uh, I you know I spent uh, one of the last sessions talking about this topic. So so Heidi, please go right ahead. Jump in. Offer your opinion. So I mean, I just have have my brief experience of working with printed circuit boards. Um, I would imagine you know if you're uh, you know basically it's it's transmission line design and it sounds great to put the ground up on the top layer and you can you know next to your trace but you're actually designing more of a coplanar structure and you really have to remember that that ground you you know for uh, ground is for potatoes and carrots <laughs> um, we're talking about the return path the metallization near the signal that's a return path and you have to remember it's not at the same potential as the the metallization on the bottom of the board and that can really cause some problems and so you have to have a lot of vias or stitching vias to try to get those potentials to be the same and then you run into questions well how many stitching vias and then you start fencing off your board because you can't route between those you know they start to block routing problems um, so I think you know in high speed digital and and I think what the the a lot of high density applications have found you really want to start designing um, transmission lanes internal to the board uh, mm -hmm. you, you have a lot of benefits with that and I found that by the time I try to put in a ground fill um, between two transmission lines uh, I've actually um, well, I, 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 like I said, if I'm routing strip line, then it's not as important. Um, you get a, the, the, coupling, the capacitive and inductive coupling cancel, and so you have a lot less crosstalk. So I guess my, my answer to that is, um, you know, just be very careful if, you're, if you think that that's going to help. Um, I've had a lot of success with just regular uh, microstrip design. Um, however, I have to admit, I do put in... Um, you do have to be careful of etching issues. And mm. so um, sometimes you have to balance the metallization on the top. You can't just have a trace with no metallization around it because then the etching uh, factors can get harder to control. So, so Rula, I see, I see you, I see, well, I see Rula aggressively agreeing with a lot of the things you're saying. Uh, is there something you want to you wanna add to that, Rula, or just want to... I mean, you to, don't want to leave planes yeah. um, flapping. You definitely want to tie down the planes too. As uh, Heidi said, you just uh, that would cause resonance and you know the other additional problems. So we never leave metal flapping. That's the key thing. I like that description. We don't want to leave metal <laughs> flapping. I like that. <laughs> um, this one's interesting. So, what is the most recommended book? And maybe you guys have the same book um, that you would recommend for PI and SI. Uh, for the PISI SI topic, maybe we just go around the around the room here. Um, Eric, I suspect I know what yours is, but let's hear what you have to say. <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, you know, I, I yeah, of course, I'm going to recommend one of my books. But <laughs> sure. you know, I'm just trying to think through before I wrote my book. Um, what did I? You know, so okay, so so one of the. You, you, one of the comments that ISFUN made a while ago, or maybe it was, I, I guess maybe everybody kind of alluded to it, is that you, when we, the re, one of the reasons we like to teach is because we learn so much in the process. And when you try to explain to somebody some principle or some effect, and you realize that you can't explain it, you get a hint that, wow, maybe I don't really understand this. As simple as stupid a thing as that, I don't understand it. And I remember an incident um, 
when I got started in this field, it was about inductance, which I think is one of the most confusing topics in the industry or in signal integrity, because we're taught it so poorly. And I mean this in the most loving way, uh, but we're taught it so poorly in school. And you know, I got my degrees in physics. I think, Heidi, you got yours in physics too, didn't you? Or double E? Uh, electrical it... engineering, double okay. E. But you went to Caltech, and so everything yeah. is physics at Caltech. Um, <laughs> and and when you learn it in physics, you get all the differential equations and the integral and all that stuff. And but you don't, and it tells you about flux linkages through coils, but you don't learn what is inductance. And I remember I encountered a uh, 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 a colleague I was working with that had a question about inductance and I tried to explain it to him. I realized I don't know what inductance is. And I spent two days in the, this is back in the days before the internet. I spent two days in the library trying to finally understand inductance. And I went through every textbook in the library, physics textbook, electrical engineering textbook. And I finally found one that really helped to help me understand it. And it was a book by um, I think Grove or Grover on, uh, it was published by Dover in 1940 or 1950. It was Frederick Grover. It was Frederick Grover, yeah. On uh, what was it called, Inductance, was that the name of it? Yes. It, yeah, and he starts from, it's, it's very mathematical, uh, but he starts from the mathematical basis and introduced the idea of partial inductance. And as soon as I learned that concept of partial inductance, wow, it all became clear. And Al Ruley over at IBM, I guess, he, mm -hmm. I don't know if he's retired or he was adjunct at, at, at Missouri Science Technology Institute. He was another strong proponent of this idea of partial inductance and was the father of many field solver tools that incorporated it. And I have to say that concept and that book just changed the way I thought about inductance. So yeah, I, I'll push my textbook, but uh, Grover's book on inductance was really influential for me. Yeah. It's so just it's been republished. Oh, sorry, uh, go ahead, Steve. Uh, oh, so it was, a, it was a book by Grove, published by Grover, titled no, Inductance on Inductance. <laughs> yeah. Leave it to a physicist to come up with such a catchy marketing title, huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> It's it's fun. Do you have a, a preferred book that you that you that you, you can recall from your either your younger days or even today? That's not one of Eric's. <laughs> well, um, for me, the uh, first book, which was really about signal integrity and also a little bit about power integrity, was from Platon Paul, Introduction to Electromagnetic Compatibility. In spite of the title, it was really the first SI book, and I still value it. So that is excellent um, feedback. I, I really, but let me go to you, Steve, because we haven't really heard from you just yet. Um, this is an interesting one, and I also think back to my youth, actually, because um, I said my father was an engineer. My first passion was actually automotive, like mechanical engineering. So I built cars and motorcycles, that sort of thing, with my father. But he taught me pretty much everything I know today, quite frankly. Um, but this is an interesting question. I'll start with you, Steve. What hardware tools should engineers, should all engineers know about or use? It's an interesting question because I talk about this one in all of my lectures. It seems to me that almost every engineer's first instrument is an oscilloscope. And that would actually be my last. Uh, my very first instrument would always be a vector network analyzer, hands down. Today is getting a lot fuzzier, and you know we, we've been working very hard to integrate vector ne network analyzer capabilities into oscilloscopes so that it can be one tool, but hands down, vector network analyzer. So let me ask, this is a question for me now. So speaking of oscilloscopes, my father uh, had a heath kit oscilloscope and i'm just curious if any of you guys actually also had that same heath kit oscilloscope and maybe this is more for uh the the, the older folks on on the panel anybody have a heath kit oscilloscope eric you're kind of smiling nothing no I, I i have a really old scope that i bought on ebay but i did not have a, a heath kit scope okay um so this is a, maybe we'll go to you ruler for this next question which is similar to the last when we talk about uh tools what software tools do you feel that all engineers should, should know and be able to use? Um, other, than, other than Altium Designer, obviously. <laughs> there, 
I, you know, to be honest with you, I haven't found one tool that fits all. Um, I, I use specific tools for specific things. Let, let's just put it that way. Um, I, I tend to use more of the ANSYS tools, tool suites, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. And uh, I use ADS and I love ADS as well. So, uh, and I mentor has their own benefits as well. So I guess you gotta figure out what tool fits what you're trying to analyze. Um, I think that's the best answer. Sure, I appreciate that. And so we are running short on time. I just got the, uh, the, the cue from my producer over here. Um, and this question I want to get addressed, it's specifically for you, Itzvan, when we talk about, it's actually an applications problem. So I figured I'd ask it. Um, does Samtech have any board-to-board -board connectors for high voltage in the 1K volt uh, range? So um, we will check this with the applications engineers. Uh, since uh, I am in, in the engineering department, sure. I cannot claim that I know all of the products. Sure. Uh, my assumption is that uh, we do. It just depends on the uh, pin configuration. If uh, we can get the name of the person who is asking, then sure. we can get uh, back sure. with, with the correct answer. Sure. So we'll make that connection. Thank you so much. And, and, and thank you to everybody on the panel. Um, I really appreciate it. I've enjoyed every one of these sessions um, and I get something from each and every one of them. So it's a pleasure uh, to have all of you here at Altium Live and I suspect that uh, the audience um, also is very keen and to see you again next year um, and we will be reaching out, you know we will.